There was an explosion. The reasons are uncertain. No one was convicted. We all remember the phrase, it sank. But why did it sink? It was a sequence of related incidents. Before summer of 2000, the crew of the submarine Kursk had never worked with a torpedo of this type. All the signatures of the committee members were fake. No one knew what was really going on. The Kursk submarine was abandoned. One channel reported the crew's alive. Another channel reported the crew members died. They were alive for at least two and a half days after the explosion. If they had asked Norway for help immediately, this scenario presented by the government does not sound plausible to me. Hi, everyone. We are in Vidyaeva. Look, what a beautiful landscape. But the name of this little northern town, along with Kursk, has become well known after the Kursk submarine explosion. And it is still associated with the tragedy. Next year is the 20th anniversary since the explosion. We'll probably hear speeches about heroism and self-sacrifice. We decided not to wait for the anniversary, because this is not a video about heroism. The demise of the Kursk submarine seems familiar to everyone. But if you go deeper and research, it turns out that no one knows enough. We all remember the phrase, it sank. But why did it sink? A torpedo exploded. Why did it explode if it was a training torpedo that was not even loaded? And one of the most important questions is whether the crew that was holed up in the notorious Section 9 after the explosion had a chance to survive. The main difficulty here for me as a journalist is that there are way too many facts, data and evidence about the Kursk now. There's a criminal case which was closed without bringing those who were responsible to account. There are about 10 alternative theories of what could have happened. We tried to study the facts that seem significant and deliver them to you. So then you can decide what happened and who is to be accused. 152. Start to pray. I'm not religious. This year, interest in the submarine was heated up by the movie Kursk, directed by Thomas Vinterberg. Luc Besson was the producer. Vinterberg highlighted several times that his main goal was to show an ordinary man who faces bureaucracy. That's why the film was compared to HBO's Chernobyl many times, but the quality of filming is nowhere near Chernobyl. Well, it could have been worse. A movie about Russians, in English, it could be treated as an offense. We knew from the very beginning it was not going to be easy. We wanted to tell the story in the most honest way. I surrounded myself not only with Russian actors, but also with experts from Russia who had been to submarines similar to the Kursk, so we could get as close to reality as possible. The film is based on the book written by journalist Robert Moore, who worked in Moscow many years ago. Apart from the official data and journalist research, we wanted to add more evidence from the book by Valery Rizantsev, Why Did the Kursk Sink? When the Kursk exploded, he was a deputy of combat training in the Navy. He was a vice admiral. The most important thing is that he was an invited expert of the investigation team at the Northern Fleet. Later, he posted a dissenting opinion, which resulted in his dismissal. I refused to work because I knew that no one would ever thank me for that. I knew that I would be harshly told off. Why so? I was told to present the full image of the expertise of the submarine at the moment of explosion. I told them that they might have to bear the consequences of that truth. So that's what you told them straight away when you were invited as an expert? Yes. And I refused to do that. Then they decided to discuss it with the Minister of Defense, Marshal Sergeyev. I was given the order to work on the case. And I followed the order. It should be explained why they asked Rizantsev. We normally call people like him nerds. He knows math really well. He worked at a submarine himself. He knows how to serve, knows all the instructions. He exposes liars. His favorite word is smoke blowers. People like him make great spies. But in everyday life, in a military setting, people like him are a pain in the neck. 
1989, after another catastrophe in the Northern Fleet, when the Komsomolets submarine sank, Rizantsev was also invited as an expert. He concluded that the crew was not ready enough and the submarine should not have been allowed to sail at all. His summary was, of course, censored. Rizantsev was scorned, but his professionalism was recognized. The official investigation summary of the government commission published after the Kursk explosion stated the following. No one was found guilty. What happened was just an accident of fate. What accident of fate could ever lead to such a catastrophe? It's impossible. They say it was a sequence of unfortunate circumstances a chain of related incidents that led to the death of the crew. I wrote, what exactly is meant by a chain of unfortunate circumstances? It's deception, misconduct of the Navy officers back then, poor assessment of training and combat readiness level of the crew. Neither the crew nor the submarines were ready for active duty. Neither was the Navy. These days, the military post of Vidyaeva doesn't look welcoming but looks like a place that is looked after. Here are some freshly painted houses. They even built a small water park here. In 2000, it all looked completely different. Even basic things like double glazing was a luxury. Renovations were done occasionally. Salaries were paid with delays. It's clear that many people struggled during the post-reform period in Russia. For these closed military towns, socialism had already gone the socialism that had made their life easy, but capitalism never came due to fences and surveillance. As a result, we have these towns looking like ruins of the USSR, as well as the ruins of the Russian army and navy. This is a rare recording of the victim of Kursk, second rank captain, Vasily Isayenko. Oleg Ivanovich, tell them we don't have enough money. <laughs> yes, because when we finally become rich, we will say, imagine, we had no money. And they'll ask, how come? How is that possible? It's possible. So say it for the historical record. Otherwise, they'll say, it's not possible that submariners have no money. <laughs> I told you the haddock stinks. Last year it did. This year I caught some and it's okay. Well, this year they don't pay us, so that's why the fish doesn't stink. I'd say the perception of a situation depends on whether the family members are together. I came to the Vidyaeva military post for the anniversary of the catastrophe, and it was the first time I looked at it from an outsider's perspective. I saw how poor it was, how shabby it was. I thought, how do people even live here? But when we lived there as a family, none of this mattered. Your family and the people around you define your world. What did your mother tell you? What were the conditions when your father joined the military service? She talked more about the feel of the place. I would say Vidyaeva is a tiny and friendly place. People's houses were close to each other. People frequently visited each other. My mother told me a story that once she came back home from a shop and I wasn't there. I was still a little kid. This happened in winter. It turned out that I had just gone to see her friends who lived three buildings away from us. At the same time, my mom's friend was walking along the street. She saw me on the way and took me back home. You know, Sergei Dorenko described it best when he went there and did a report. Yes, it was 19 years ago. It was broadcast on Channel One. He probably managed to reflect the reality in which we lived. 
He managed to present what it was like. Sergei Darenko came to Vidyaeva in August 2000, two weeks after the explosion, and released an episode of his own program that turns out to be his last program. Because in this show, he says that Putin is personally responsible for the accident, and the show was cancelled right after that. It's obvious that the Minister of Defense was lying. Vladimir Putin knew it when he was defending the minister. It's difficult to accuse me of being someone who supports the government or censorship. But it's important to understand that the actual head of Channel One, Boris Berezovsky, started an active anti-Putin media campaign, though a year before Berezovsky assisted him with coming to power. Dorenko, who worked for Berezovsky, made what we call in journalism a massacre, a really harsh and biased report. At the same time, Dorenko was talented at his job, and he wanted to show the audience the depressing atmosphere in the town in August 2000. No matter what, they will serve in the army. I don't know what our people are made of, but they will serve anyway. Has your opinion changed over the last 19 years? I know many people who indeed would go and serve. No matter what happens, they are men of deed, they are men of their word. Some people do a good deed, while others are looking to avoid doing something that's worthy. The ships were moored in the harbor with no fuel or repair. The Navy had literally stalled. Many midshipmen quit because there was no salary, there was no accommodation for them, there was no hope that things might improve. In the new movie Kursk, the daily life of the sailors is depicted in great detail. For Winterberg, as well as for many people in Russia, the fact that people in these miserable circumstances went on serving in the military is strong evidence of their heroism. Guys, don't hang around. There's still no money. So what are we supposed to live on? Unfortunately, in reality, the events that happened in the sea and on land are even more tightly connected. If there's not enough money, the level of combat readiness will inevitably fall, since the army and navy are expensive. If you don't invest in it, it will collapse. You wrote that in 1998 you had to visit the Northern Fleet and you were shocked by the condition of the first flotilla. Why so? Yes, because I saw the torpedoes of the first flotilla submarines. During the inspections, the submarine's torpedoes were said to be in excellent condition. The Northern Fleet had won all of the possible prizes for the torpedoes' readiness and their condition. I completely disagreed. I was arguing with them. For example, Mikhail Matsak, who led the nuclear-powered submarines of the first flotilla of the Northern Fleet from 1994 to 1999. According to his formal duties, he was supposed to sum up the results of torpedoes functioning twice a year. Nothing like that was ever done. They did not show me any results of his reports. And this happened for a few years before the explosion. Yes, my report was presented to the Admiral of the Northern Fleet. And then? And then nothing happened. The Kursk crew spent very little time sailing. It was about 12 to 14 days a year on average. An investigation proved that they only had one proper torpedo training in a three-year time. We should emphasize that the torpedo was a different type from the one that exploded during its final exercise. Every mission was important. When the Kursk put out to the Mediterranean Sea in 1999, this was presented as an important victory. Here is the scene of their arrival. Submarine commander Gennady Lyachin was awarded Hero of Russia. This is Lyachin's workplace. It used to be the dormitory of the Kursk crew. Now it's a museum. The office looks exactly the way it was. What's interesting about awarding Lyachin with the Hero title is that the order for the award was given only on August 26, 2000 because the ceremony was planned for September of 2000. 
But the decree was released after the catastrophe. So it was a posthumous award. Do you know how they presented it? Kursk was a Project 949A submarine. It sailed to the Mediterranean, and its combat characteristics were stronger than the 6th American fleet, something like this. Today, the submarine Kursk has come back, having successfully completed all our objectives set in the global ocean. After returning to port, the Kursk crew did not go out to sea for eight months and 21 days. The Navy could not financially afford it. The figures are important, because if a crew doesn't go out to sea for nine months, it means the sub will have to go through multiple checks and inspections. It will not be considered seaworthy and will have to do the training again. Your commanding officers and I prepared you for sailing. I inspected all of you. I sent you off from this pier. Have you seen the documentary films that were made after the explosion? I watched them back then, with my mom, when I was a child. Now it's difficult to think about it, even to look at the photos. Watching a film might feel even worse. Have you thought about trying to find out the truth? I have, but I have no idea how I can do that. I mean, how to search, where? Since Nastya Hivuk said she wants to understand what exactly happened, am I right? Yes. We brought her to an important interview, which we are doing for the episode. We will interview Yelena Milashina. This is their office. Since 2000, she has been looking into the Kursk investigation, and she has written a lot about it. She probably knows this topic better than any other journalist. That's why we're here. Nastya, let's go. The submarine crew tried to complete objectives which it was not ready for because the training was conducted spontaneously. Though torpedo shooting is a regular thing for submariners, the military commanders thought that no matter what, the training must be carried out. It was important to the commander-in-chief of the Navy to show that the training was carried out. And it was important to show the capacity of our Army and Navy. The submarine K-141 Kursk was launched on May 14, 1994. Here is a detailed model of it. Here is the picture of its construction. It's a submarine of Project 949A. It's equipped with 24 cruise missiles. They were located here, at the sides. The main function of such submarines during a war is to destroy the enemy's aircraft carrier groups, because during the Cold War, the USA had a lot more aircraft carriers than the USSR. These submarines were constructed to catch up with the USA. Apart from missiles, the submarine is also equipped with torpedoes. They're located in the front of the submarine. You can even see them here. It can be any type of torpedo, including those whale torpedoes, which are also called the 6576A. This torpedo is called a peroxide torpedo because hydrogen peroxide is needed for fuel combustion. It acts as an acidifier. An aggressive liquid can cause fire and easily explode when it comes into contact with different objects. I think it was in 1956 when a diesel submarine with peroxide torpedo exploded in the UK. The torpedo was acidified with a strong solution of peroxide it sank next to the pier as soon as it exploded. No one in the USSR knew about this explosion. So we went on developing similar torpedoes. Before the summer of 2000, the Kursk crew never had to deal with that type of torpedo. I mean, they knew about its construction, but they hadn't worked with it before. The torpedoes first arrived on board the submarine in August 2000 during preparation for the training. Two torpedoes were real, and one was a mock torpedo designed for combat training. The latter was not charged with explosive filling, but it contained the dangerous peroxide, just like real torpedoes do. 
The chief midshipman Eldarov could not connect the torpedo to the degassing system. He knew the theory, but he had never practiced how to do it. So what did he do? He invited a torpedo specialist from the other submarine that was based nearby. They had those torpedoes on board, and they were connected to the degassing system. Did that torpedo specialist say this? Yes, he provided the testimony. He said he arrived at the submarine and discovered that neither BCH-3 commander nor the flagship specialist were there. Only the petty officer was there. The specialist connected the torpedo to the system. He demonstrated to Eldarov how to connect it, and then he left. Can you explain, I thought the crew was a team that works together for a long period of time and they know each other quite well. I thought there were people who can rely on each other, right? That's what a person who's not involved will think about their relationship. Well, people in the crew came and left. Some of them had just quit their job, some had just been appointed. Some had been transferred to work in another place, so a part of the crew was new, including the torpedo specialist. Yes, two torpedo specialists were sent from other submarines. Initially, they were from a different crew. On Thursday, August 10th at 10.30 p.m., the Kursk left this pier for its last sail. They left for a fleet training commanded by Vyacheslav Popov. He and other commanders went into open waters on a nuclear-powered guided missile cruiser, Pyotr Veliki. They were supposed to act as a mock enemy during the training. After a day and a half, from 11.40 a.m. to 1.20 p.m. on Saturday, August 12th, the Kursk was meant to detect the mock enemy in the designated area of the Barents Sea and attack it with the mock torpedo. The countdown to the explosion had begun. Morning, August 12th, the Pyotr Veliki and the cruisers were approaching the location where the training was supposed to take place. Acoustic detectors of the cruiser had already discovered the submarine. So, we understand that if it was not a training but a real battle, detecting the submarine like that would mean a failure. But okay, it was just a training. At 11.30 a.m., Pyotr Veliki detected an acoustic signal similar to an underwater explosion. The bearing signal, or the direction, is straight ahead. The news was reported to Admiral Popov. Luckily, he was right there on the cruiser. And then, it's hard to believe, but neither Popov nor the other commanders paid any attention to that report. The time of the mock attack had arrived and still nothing had happened. The Kursk was not responding. According to the rules, a submarine has to resurface in an hour and report the results of the attack. Even if they had not completed the task, they should have come out. Those are officially documented rules. Therefore, the sub had to come out by 2.40 p.m. at the latest. If it doesn't happen within an hour, the commander has to announce an emergency. Why do you think they didn't do that? Because the commanders were not ready to deal with it. Because it hadn't surfaced by 2.40 p.m., they started throwing bomb bags in the water. These are sound effect bags to inform the submarine to stop performing the task and resurface immediately. And nothing happened? No, nothing. The documents say if, after the emergency signal, a submarine doesn't resurface, the commander has to announce an emergency. And again, they hadn't done it. At 5.30 p.m., they involved aviation. The planes were looking for them until 8 p.m. They didn't find it. They hadn't announced an emergency again. They came to the realization that something clearly had gone wrong. At 11.30 p.m., they announced an emergency case. They started to properly look for it. It was so chaotic, no one really knew what was going on. 
Курск бросили, когда... The Kursk was abandoned after the explosion. И вместо того, чтобы действовать четко по инструкциям... Instead of following the instructions, which they were supposed to do, непосредственно команда... Попов gave an order to leave the area. Уйти из района. Он ждал, что... He expected the Kursk to resurface. У всех... No one, including Popov, could believe a submarine like that could simply sink. At that time, I was working as a reporter for the NTV channel, and I remember well how we were told about the explosion. On Monday, August 14th, we received the following message. During a military training in the Barents Sea, a nuclear-powered submarine, the Kursk, sank. It was not presented as a catastrophe, but later the specialist explained that nuclear-powered submarines of that class do not sink. You might want to ask why we only heard about it on Monday, if the training took place on Saturday. For two days, the Northern Fleet kept silent about the catastrophe. As for Popov, he left the cruiser on a helicopter on Saturday afternoon. When it became clear that something had gone wrong, he just left the place. Popov flew off to a press conference where he reported that the training had gone well. And by that moment he already, yes, he already knew that something had gone wrong. I was not at home when it happened. My kids told me, Mom, don't worry, we got a call, and there's bad news and good news. I was just about to enter our flat, and they asked, which submarine was Dad on? They were checking if they had remembered the information correctly. I said it was the Kursk, and they replied that it had sunk. I was told earlier that this type of submarine cannot sink. Under no circumstances would this be possible. It was something to do with the construction. The good news was that everyone was alive. Everything was okay. That's what we were told. We were told that they are knocking from the inside and so on. Some people started to panic. Some didn't understand what was going on. We started to gather at the officer's club. Someone promised to provide an explanation. The younger women, the wives, they started to panic. Some of them fainted. Here are the plans of the torpedo 6576A, or the whale. It's scaled down here. We've highlighted the main elements here. First of all, I'll talk about the results of the official investigation. They said it all started because of the low quality of the welded seams. The peroxide balloon, here it is, the big bubble, had acidifier leaks. Hydrogen peroxide is a very aggressive liquid. It leaked right into the torpedo section. It was mixed with the lubricant and with the torpedo's coating. A chemical reaction with high heat generation began, and then fire. The core element of the torpedo was heated up. The pressure increased. Finally, the peroxide balloon exploded. All the components were then mixed up, and a massive explosion destroyed the front part of the torpedo. It caused the immediate death of everyone in the front section. Then fire took over the first section. It lasted for 2 minutes and 18 seconds. During that time, the temperature went really high, so that it caused detonation of all the other torpedoes in the first section. This is the official version of the Kursk explosion. This official version does not sound plausible to me. Why? It sounds too unreal. First of all, the torpedo was installed in the submarine on the 3rd of August. From the 3rd up to the 12th of August, the torpedo was in the storage section. It had not been allocated in the torpedo section yet. It was connected to the controlling system. There were no leaks. Everything was fine. For how many days? Almost 10 days. No leaks. Not a single leak. So why, three hours after it was installed, did the leaks suddenly appear? According to Rizantsev's version, even if it indeed had leaked, it could not have led to the explosion. The explanation is simple. At the moment of the explosion, when 15 to 20 minutes were left before the planned attack, and the Kursk was ready for the attack, the torpedo section filled with water. This means it was impossible for a fire to start.
Moreover, if things really did happen the way the official version is stating, the amount of water which got into the first section after the explosion would have filled the whole section with water in those 138 seconds that they had between the first and the second explosion. Again, no fire would have been possible there. What happened then, according to Rizantsev's version? He thinks that since the crew had never worked with that type of torpedo, they made a fatal mistake. Before the torpedo was supposed to be launched, they discovered that the pressure in the chamber was too low. It's a usual thing to happen. The pressure can be restored to the right level by connecting the torpedo to a high-pressure tube, which they had on the submarine. Rizantsev believes that the air in the tube was not filtered the way it should have been filtered. The unfiltered air from the submarine pipeline contained dust, which got into the torpedo. While carrying out the investigation, I discovered that some documents were falsified. They were provided by the Northern Fleet and stated that the submarine and its torpedo system were degreased. The Commission approved it, but all of the signatures of the Commission were fake. Graphology tests confirmed my theory. And I was right. Can you explain what happens to the pipeline if it's not being degreased? It might lead to a situation when hydrogen peroxide explodes after contact with the tube. Tiny bits in the air or in the pipeline might cause this reaction. While the torpedo was in the storage section, it was fine, because the pressure valve was closed. Here it is in the picture, indicated as number 7. The unfiltered air remained in the high-pressure chamber, inside the torpedo. Later, it was moved to the torpedo section. The valve was opened according to the instructions. Air was not supposed to leak, because there was one more security device, the trigger valve. Here it is. It's released automatically when a torpedo leaves the torpedo section, but its mechanism is tricky. If it is left a tiny bit open, which can happen accidentally, then the unfiltered high-pressured air will be released into the chamber, which has acidifier in it. The dust will cause a chemical reaction, leading to heat emission. It will explode very quickly. It will be impossible to find out the reason. So, the instructions for this torpedo prescribe certain regulations about the trigger valve. Its condition must be checked before the torpedo is installed in the torpedo section. Rizantsev thinks that the crew members were not aware of this rule. During the investigation, I discovered that the manual the crew was given did not have relevant info about the torpedo. They were given instructions for another submarine's torpedo. According to Rizantsev's version, unfiltered air from the high-pressure chamber entered the chamber with acidifier. The bits of dust caused a chemical reaction, which then led to a heat explosion, equal to 200 kilograms of TNT. You might be wondering why I'm providing all these details, and whether the reason for the explosion actually makes any difference. Well, who's going to bear the responsibility? If the official investigation was genuine, then the producer of the torpedo should be accused. It was produced in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is a separate independent country, which makes it impossible to find someone to accuse. However, if Rizantsev's theory is correct, then the explosion was the result of criminal negligence in the Navy. Okay, here's the most important thing. The explosion of acidifier in the torpedo could not have led to the submarine explosion. It still could have resurfaced. The members of the crew who were not in the first sector had a chance to survive. Why didn't we see them resurface? The manufacturer's instructions say that in order to reduce the possibility of an explosion, when the air pressure suddenly increases, the first section 
has to be decompressed. It means the first and second sectors should be connected to each other. The main control board is in the second section. And the captain? Yes. And the control board is also in that section. Do you mean to say the construction of the Kursk had an engineering design flaw? It was not a tiny problem. They neglected something very important when working on the submarine's construction. The submarine went out of control, and therefore it sank. The explosion of the mock torpedo disabled the control section of the whole submarine. So they lost control of the submarine. As the water filled the first section, the submarine started to sink. In a couple of seconds, it hit the seabed. Its massive weight caused the destruction of the real torpedoes that could explode. They detonated. A massive explosion followed. It turned the submarine's first, second, and third sections into wrecks. The submarine was turned into a pile of metal. The explosion blast dragged and spined the submarine through the seabed, leaving deep hollows and scratches on the sub's body. If the official investigation had released this info, then a few questions could have been addressed to the sub-manufacturer Rubin, whose representatives took part in the investigation. Why was the control board section based in the place where it can be easily destroyed, along with the submarine's commanders, if something goes wrong? The official investigation demonstrated to us their version. However, it did not explain the origin of the hollows and the scratches on the submarine's body. That's why the theory of crashing into an American submarine came up. There was also a theory about an external torpedo that destroyed the Kursk. This version still exists. Many mariners and families of the dead crew members of the Kursk support this version. It certainly happened as a result of an external factor. They say the first explosion took place. Now, I work in a related sphere. I know what these statements stand for. They reported that the explosion took place in the intersection area, at the level of the petrol tanks. Something exploded at the same level, but no one knows what it was. So you think that it was someone else's torpedo? Well, it's probably too late to talk about it. The sailors who survived the explosions moved from the 6th, 7th and 8th section to the 9th section. It's called the life support section. They were waiting to be rescued. On the 15th of August, three days after the explosion, the Northern Fleet Commander's press secretary, Mikhail Matsak, announced that they had established tapping communication with the crew. On the 17th of August, the press secretary announced that all crew members died during the first hours after the explosion. If you think about it, it looks like an experiment. We're the victims of technical progress. We were unsure about the fate of our fathers, our husbands, our sons. We were shown the news live on TV, and this uncertainty lasted for 24 hours a day. It lasted for at least two weeks. You mean when it was still unclear whether they survived? Okay, one channel said the crew is alive. They're knocking and making sounds. 20 minutes later, another channel announced that the crew died. Okay, again, after 40 minutes, another channel announced that the crew died. 20 minutes later, here we come again. They said the crew was alive. This went on for at least two weeks. How long could the sailors have stayed alive in the ninth section? Was there any chance to save them if Russia had accepted the aid from Norway and the UK as soon as it had been offered? This was offered two days after the explosion. 
They remained alive for at least two and a half days. Their SOS tapping and other noises were recorded. From listening to these recordings, experts can conclude that the people inside were alive. It was the sound of metal on metal tapping. The nature of the sounds also proved that the submarine was on the seabed. This version also doesn't look coherent, and the evidence does not seem realistic. There's an emergency station in the sector that starts to automatically send signals in case of an emergency. If someone is searching for the submarine, they send a signal, and this sunk submarine receives it. They should reply to the signal. So you think that no one was hitting the sub with a hammer from inside? No, no, it would not make sense. These sounds had a certain pattern. Knock, silence, knock, knock, knock. This had gone on for two days, while the station battery was still working. If the sailors had survived through the two days and had really been knocking from the inside, if these sounds were produced by a human, the sailors would have written a lot more notes about what happened. Only three notes written by sailors were found in the ninth section. They would have provided evidence about the condition of the submarine, and they would have described the measures they tried to take. Apart from the most famous note written by Captain Kalesnikov, notes written by Midshipman Borisov and Captain Lieutenant Sergei Sorelenko were also found. These notes mentioned that the crew members felt unwell, and if they resurfaced, they would not be able to overcome the compression. Sorelenko wrote, we will not last for more than 24 hours. Some data from Kalesnikov's note, we will try to get out. They had suits like this one. They tried to put them on. This is a wetsuit. Here is an individual oxygen tank. These suits still exist in the Russian Navy. They are used on submarines. They can be used to resurface from up to 100 meters. The Kursk sank to the 108 meters depth. The submarine was huge, so the escape window was located around 90 or 100 meters. In theory, there was a chance for them to survive in these suits. In this famous Russian movie, which describes a very similar setting, Makovetsky uses this suit to swim off of the submarine. So why didn't the Kursk sailors use the suits? The answer is in the note of Sodilenko. If we were to resurface, the high pressure which occurred in the emergency section would have caused decompression disease. Another option to escape was to use a buoy. A cord needs to be attached to a buoy, and the sailors climb up to the surface using this construction. But this is physically demanding and requires them to partly fill the section with water. The survivors were exhausted by then, feeling cold, sitting in complete darkness. They were very unlikely to perform the actions needed. I will tell you something, a secret that was never mentioned in any document before. When the submarine was brought to the surface and taken to the dock, the military investigators held a reenactment at a submarine similar to the Kursk. They selected 23 crew members from a submarine similar to Kursk. They held similar ranks and positions in the military to those in the Kursk's crew. They created conditions similar to those at the Kursk. Darkness and high air pressure. They were told to get themselves and the escape window ready for evacuation. The submarine was docked at the pier. The crew failed to do what they were told to, though the situation was not at all stressful. 
They were simply by the pier. Their lives were not in danger, but they could not do it. They could not get the escape window ready in order to leave the submarine. The crew knew that the other Northern Fleet sailors were aware of the explosion and were hoping to be rescued immediately. They decided that staying in Section 9 was the safest thing to do. Imagine you were up there and your friends are here. You'd strain every nerve to save them. Nothing would stop you from saving them, of course. Trying to make sense of the rescue operation of the Kursk is difficult. We have way too many unstructured facts. The fleet was not ready for that training. We know that the emergency situation was announced only 12 hours after the explosion. The exact location of the submarine was detected at 9 a.m. the next day by the Pyotr Veliki. It was not until August 15th when the Navy headquarters started the rescue operation using deep diving vehicles. They tried to conjoin the emergency exit of the ninth section to the rescuing machine multiple times. They failed probably because the rescue vehicle hadn't been properly maintained. The rubber seals in the vehicle that are necessary for conjoining had probably never been replaced. The Kursk film shows it in great detail. This thing is supposed to be changed once a year. How long has this seal been here? Air and heat could have been supplied to the ninth section from the outside. The submarine had all the equipment needed for this. However, you need divers in order to enable the supply. There actually were divers, but a compression chamber, which was needed to perform the task, was not there. Russian divers had to fly to the Norwegian ship Seaway Eagle. By the 20th of August, it reached the place of the explosion. It became clear foreign aid was necessary. It had been eight days since the explosion. At the end of the film, we see Norwegian divers finally getting to the submarine. They used this device to understand that the pressure in the ninth section was the same as the pressure outside, which meant that the people inside the section were all dead. The scene is really close to reality. The Norwegians were the first to dive back then. We found one of them. His name is Paul Dinesen. He still works in a private diving company. Now he is on a long vacation in Thailand. I will never forget that. It will stay with me till the end of my life. It was a challenging experience. It was quite dark, although the depth was only about 108 meters, I think. I jumped off and landed on the submarine body. It was unbelievably large. I've seen lots of different objects underwater, but their sizes are nowhere near the size of the Kursk submarine. I just could not wrap my mind around this. I thought, amazing, I am here. I hope they're alive and we have chances to save them. This is how I remember it. Well, we were not lucky, and they were not lucky. The following dives the Norwegians did were done together with the Russians. The Russian team was led by Andrei Zviaginsev. He was awarded the Hero of Russia medal for taking part in it. We went through trainings. We had submarines communities like we had one at the Kursk. We all knew each other. Some of us were friends. Some joined the Brotherhood of Mariners. You're taught that a submarine is a living organism. Then you discover a silent and motionless, soundless and very dark body. How dramatic it was. That huge thing was motionless. It looked impressive. I still think it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. How did the Russian side treat you? It said that the Russian military men were distrustful of foreign specialists. You know, that's a common thing to have in any country's navy, when you do not have an open system. It cannot be open by definition, because an army is always about a country's internal affairs. So you're always forced to follow certain regulations. 
So this applies to the U.S., Spanish, British, Russian, Korean, and other countries' navy. We are forced to communicate with others depending on how much budget you have, the political agenda, your politics, and everything. What would have happened if you had sought the Norwegians' help immediately? Even if we had, I don't think we would have had enough time to save them. You arrived on the ninth day, correct? Yes, that's correct. But based on the carbon monoxide level in the submarine, you've seen the film, right? Well, the facts in the film don't quite match reality. We managed to do air tests. The sub was not flooded to such an extent as shown in the film. We also know that the ninth section crew members were found with their bodies burned. It's highly likely that their bodies were burned because of an explosion that occurred at some point. The oxygen production mechanism exploded. After that, there was almost no chance for them to survive. Even if they were still alive, all of the oxygen would have been burnt by then, and it would not have been possible to breathe. We will probably never know when this explosion took place. The relatives of the sailors who were not living in Vidyaeva were taken here from Moscow and then were temporarily based on an ambulance boat, the Sphere. A charitable organization worked closely with them. The organization had connections with Commerçant magazine, where Andrei Kalesnikov worked as a reporter. By that time, Andrei had unofficially become Putin's biographer. He had already become co-author of a book called Conversations with Putin. He was to follow the president wherever he went after that book was released. He came to Vidyaeva as a volunteer of this organization. No one here knew he was a journalist. They are clever people. They knew that the Kursk crew had sailors from two different submarines. Putin was also aware of this. They also knew that our fleet was not up to a high standard. But you know, saying it out loud, understanding what happened is not that hard. Accepting it is a lot more difficult. Especially if what had happened was no one's fault. Searching for external reasons helped them to feel better about it. This is the officers' club in Vidyaeva, where the most dramatic part of the tragedy took place. The wives of the Kursk crew members gathered here. No one had managed to tell them that they were already widows. In the Kursk movie, by Winterberg, there's a scene where the relatives and even children of the dead look despisingly at the admiral. He's presented as if he led the rescue operation, which he did not. In reality, the situation was even worse. One woman broke into the office of the chief executive, Ilya Khlebanov, and grabbed him, begging him to tell her the truth about what had happened. Khlebanov was bewildered and his guards simply dragged the woman out of the office. Several people even attempted to give a speech. They even started saying something. There was someone, I hope I'm not mistaken, I think it was the fleet commander. Popov? Yes, Popov. He told these ladies in the hall of the officers' club, do you think they are alive? Well, you know, I feel my father, who died in 1991, is now still alive. But then they took their words back. They were so stressed at that time, so they could not be honest about what had really happened.
что да, все кончено, надежды. They could not say that there was no hope. И как ни странно, мне кажется, I personally think the wives wanted to hear the truth. Everyone was waiting for him to arrive here. Relatives of the Kursk crew finally heard the truth from him. He arrived on the 22nd of August, 10 days after the explosion. Journalists were not allowed to come in. Putin's meeting with the relatives of the dead was confidential. But some journalists managed to sneak in. The meeting's transcript was provided by Andrei Kolesnikov, and it was published afterward. It was believed that there was no video recording of the meeting. However, money helped us to find it. If I could have, I would have gone to save them myself. Neither the Russian nor the foreign specialists could reach the 8th section. After he said that, then repeated it again, two women sitting next to me immediately fell asleep. They hadn't had any sleep for several days. Nothing could relieve their insomnia. They couldn't fall asleep when their husbands, their brothers, were still in these air bubbles on the submarine. From your article, I got the impression that the culmination of the meeting, when he got all the attention, was when he talked about compensation. One woman asked to give her husband's salary for 10 years ahead, and Putin agreed. You were saying that he wanted to use this opportunity. Well, yes. The sums of money that were discussed in the hall were incredible. Putin said that everyone would receive the average salary for 10 years. Everyone would get the compensation. He was not joking. They were to receive 10 years' salary, an apartment. So in today's dollars, it would have been millions of dollars? Yes, for each of them. Sure. It confused everyone. Do you get the feeling that the authorities, who did not take every possible measure to save them, are now trying to pay you off? No, that's not what I think. I asked them. I asked them to give me money. And they gave it to me. They could have decided not to give it to me. I think we should have received more. The info that we are still getting up to now, they were not paying enough attention to it. They did not invest in the fleet. We had been working for the fleet for 10 years. We were the only ones who had operational division, and we were the only ones who had operating submarines. So I think we should have received more. It's hard to tell now. I personally did not feel that Putin tried to pay them off. When the wave of nationwide sympathy had passed, by the time we were supposed to have overcome the pain of loss, you know, people started to change their mind. They started coming back to their normal lives and they thought, well, those families received so much and we got nothing. Some people started to envy you. You received your husband's salary for 10 years and we did not, they were thinking. Yes, that's correct. Among the wives of the sailors, this did not happen, but I could feel this attitude from others. It did not feel nice. A lot of us in St. Petersburg, and for many years, we only communicated with each other within our group. Do you think he had an idea of what had really happened by the time he arrived in Vidyaeva, or did the admirals leave him unaware of the situation? 
First of all, I think the admirals were not aware of it either. I was not actually satisfied with the president's answer when he was asked why he stayed away from the explosion for so many days. He said he didn't want to interfere. He said, imagine if I brought all my staff here and everyone would have only thought about pleasing me. If I arrived with my team, it would have caused trouble for everyone. Yes, things would have gone differently then. It was important to feel the moment. Everyone should have agreed that this was the best way to handle the situation. Again, I was not happy with this explanation. I think he actually regretted not coming. Maybe he was even blaming himself for that because he did have time to come. The decisions that he did not make, there was probably a chance for them to be made. What do you mean? Do you think they could have been saved? Maybe. Maybe. You know, they could have done something with the international aid. In fact, it's good that the president did not rush to the scene. He did not drag all the attention to himself. People accuse him for having fun in Sochi back then with female journalists who were wearing bikinis under their dresses while the sailors at the sub were fighting for their lives. I think this is all gossip. Putin should have stayed in Sochi, in Moscow. There was nothing for him to do in Vidyaeva. There is no certain place where he would have had to stay. He was responsible for other things. What happened with the submarine? It sank. What did you think after the interview with Larry King? Did he ever regret saying it sank? I don't think so. Well, the assumption that he should regret saying it is wrong. I still think there was nothing wrong with saying that. A certain type of question will give you a certain type of answer. There were problems with the translation? This is the only answer that you can expect for the question, what happened to your submarine? Your was emphasized. He asked it in a manner like he did not know what happened. It was a mess you cannot even imagine. All the resources were squandered. He said one of his key phrases of his whole presidency. He said he is responsible for 100 days of his rule. But as for the previous 15 years, he also has some questions to ask. Yes. No one expected to hear that. Maybe it was not even addressed to the people in the hall. They were thinking about their own losses at that moment. Later on, I think, he tried to avoid clear and unambiguous statements like that one. I read the summary of the investigation again yesterday. We were given this summary on 162 pages. The summary of the official investigation? Yes. When they said they would no longer be investigating and no one was convicted. So I read it again yesterday. <laughs> to be fair, I never felt that bitter. So many years have passed, and now I can certainly say that. They committed a crime. They deceived us. They said an explosion took place, the reasons are unclear, no one was convicted. They admit that the regulations were not followed in the way they should have been, but it was not anyone's fault. 
Ну, не знаю, вот даже, даже вот то, что... I don't know. I read it yesterday. They listed certain names and said that these people should have gone to the sea because they had to do training. They had to be at that submarine's training. For some reason, those who had to go did not go. And instead of them, some less qualified sailors were sent to sea. My understanding is that one of these unqualified was my husband. He was not working on that submarine. He was just sent there to replace someone else. I do not understand. What for? He was not ready. He was told it would be fine, and he went. In the end, the case was dismissed. No one was convicted. About 15 military officials were dismissed. But in Putin's decree about their suspension, the Kursk case was not even mentioned. No one was sent to prison, not even to court. Everyone went on living their normal lives. For example, ex-admiral of the Northern Fleet, Popov, became a senator, a Murmansk Oblast representative in the Federation Council. He also became head of the Senate in the National Marine Policy Department. By the way, here in Vidyaeva, we've discovered that people still like Popov, because during the tough years when the fleet was going through hard times, Popov was treating people nicely. I firmly believe that the government should not try to save money when financing the army. Vladimir Ustinov came to see Putin with a report. I think that report also included Rizantsev's expertise. So Putin was given the real facts? Yes, but I think that he just did not want to come back to that again. Well, a lot of people would have gone to prison. It would have been a serious thing. You know, normally there are sanctions on people who are accused of committing a crime like that, including captains, because it's the right thing to do. You might disagree with it, but I think it's the right thing to do. The captain bears full responsibility. But the problem is, the whole submarine affair had to do with politics as well. Not a single official statement was made about the submarine's engineering design flaw or the incorrect location of the section where the crew was based. We still have six submarines of the 949A project operating, and two more are being modernized. This wall in the Vidyaeva Museum commemorates the sailors who died in duty in the time of peace. A number of unknown cases are mentioned here, including those during the Soviet era. For example, here is the K-131 submarine, which burned in 1984. Thirteen people died there. Here's a model of a submarine whose missile pit had exploded. People also died there. Apparently, no one had access to this info during Soviet times. Overall, during the entire history of the Soviet and the modern Russian period, the fleet lost more than a thousand people. Before the case of the Losharik submarine in July this year, the loss accounted for 988 people. We were on the verge of facing similar incidents again. Just because we don't fix the problems that we are aware of, Nastya, do you have a better understanding of what happened now? Pretty much. I'm really curious why they had that many versions of the accident, like there was the official version and then the others. Yes, Nastya was talking about that version, that it was a foreign submarine that smashed into the Kursk or a torpedo launched by someone else to blow up the Kursk. I think the military wanted to spread this version. For them, it's not just one of the versions. They firmly believe it's true. They simply fulfilled their duty. We know exactly what was happening during the years of their service. But for others, 
They had simply fulfilled their duty. So they were loyal to their oath till the very end. Yes, regardless of any difficulties or lack of financing in the fleet and how the country was collapsing, they lived in Vidyaeva and went on with their duties. Do you think it was an act of heroism? Yes. I agree with you. I recall an old saying, person's heroism is a result of someone else's negligence. I focus on filming documentaries that are related to modern Russian history, and this saying fits any situation that I film. Memories about the dead sailors are sacred. All we can hope for is that a similar thing will never happen again. Кто из нас ровесники, кто герой, кто чмо. Капитан Колесников пишет нам письмо. Vladimir Ustinov, the ex-prosecutor general, Ilya Khlebanov, the chair of the Kursk Investigation Commission, and Vyacheslav Popov, ex-Northern Fleet commander, all refused to grant us an interview. 